It is quite unprofessional to take Russian command structures at face value when they had been built by the KGB. For most people internationally, Vladimir Putin is the only Russian leading figure they can recognize by name and by his face. Some people may even recognize the foreign minister Lavrov at this point, but that is usually it. For many different reasons, we get the appearance of a Stalin-esque singular ruler who may or may not be deposed by others around him or just dies unexpectedly. Yet he may be a simple asset used by far more experienced KGB personnel who can strategically ditch him when it suits them to pretend a reset in leadership and to resume normal international diplomacy and trade relations. Now, the first natural impulse for the KGB after 1991 would have been to obfuscate the actual true chain of command, create a variety of fake oligarchs and front companies, and let the world play the guessing game. A war of the magnitude currently at play is always a careful imperial calculation. Where do we stand right now? What are we lacking? How do we get what we need? Where will we be 10 years from now? Is war more lucrative than peace? Can we afford peace at all? Even 2000 years ago, Roman Emperor Caesar carefully planned an invasion into Gallic territory, created a pretext, planned to kill a sizable portion of Gallic men, plan to take the rest of those people as loot and to force Roman culture onto the Gallic territories. In the same way, the Russian leadership prepared the Ukraine invasion for years and executed the plan to kill men, steal the rest of their people, plus the territory, plus the valuable industry that is essential to the Russian military industrial complex, and to force Russian culture and the language onto Ukrainians. In, in public, Russia has been spreading false narratives for why this invasion happened, and even Western powers refuse to present a clear picture of the Russian imperial calculation, because that would create public pressure to understand since when Western powers had to be nearly certain or dead certain that this war would happen. It's far easier for Western politicians and media to focus on Putin's personality, his personal grievances and ambitions. Not only do we have to approximate the true Russian chain of command and imperial war calculation, we also have to take into account the balance of the three superpowers and their incentive to coordinate with each other to maintain their status. As much as the United States and Russia trash talk each other, it's always easier to settle than to battle it out indefinitely. We may even be looking at a cartel of the superpowers. Let's focus on the calculation. As early as the 1970s, the Soviet rulers knew that socialism would never keep up, never surpass capitalism, and wouldn't even be enough to maintain a sizable Slavic Russian population. The demographics were as bad as the economics and the percentage of Russian Slavs within the Soviet Union was shrinking. The natural population of Russia decreased by an additional 12 million between 1992 and 2010. Ukraine's independence meant the loss of tens of millions of Slavic citizens. Soviet leaders had invested greatly in Ukraine and turned a farmer's nation into an industrial powerhouse, where a third of war-related production took place. Even up to 2014, Ukrainian industry built guidance systems for Russian missiles, warships, helicopter engines, and countless other parts. Even nuclear missiles were supposed to be serviced by Ukrainians. When exports ground to a halt in 2015, Russia was not able to replace all those industrial centers and the hundreds of thousands of experts and skilled workers. The option of not fully invading Ukraine was probably the worst and most costly option for Russia and the one option that threatened its superpower status. 
what is the use of nuclear warheads if your rockets don't fly and your other carrier systems are not operational. One Ukrainian industry complex even announced they would give nuclear rocket secrets to NATO. Now the next aspect it's uh, the next aspect is the war is not a television war. Many Western Europeans and Americans hope this conflict will remain a television and internet war for them that they can turn off whenever they want. Once the Ukraine war escalates into a larger multi-scene conflict and once there is new conscription in the United States, it will be real for ordinary taxpayers. When 20-year-old Americans are shipped to Asia for a proxy war against North Korea or something like that. The Ukraine war may take years. It could be ended by Russia within, with three small nuclear warheads in a very short amount of time. China has its Belt Road Initiative, which is a military-grade network that stretches all the way to Europe, so we can't rule out the possibility that 250,000 Chinese troops will enter the conflict in Ukraine. Now, China's Belt and Road Initiative, launched by President Xi Jinping in 2013, is a massive international infrastructure program involving nearly 140 countries with uh, over an estimated $1 trillion in projects uh, related to energy, transportation, digital networks, and trade. Beijing has gone to great lengths to minimize the links to the People's Liberation Army and to downplay the initiative's geostrategic overtones. Russia was acting really low-key from 1991 to 2008, and people all over the world lost interest. Scientific authors and even traditional conspiracy authors lost interest. Many older people now who cared about world affairs during the Cold War neglected Russia from 1991 up to 2008 or even 2014. Younger people today were not around during the Cold War or still children. Once those younger people became interested in world affairs, Russia seemed uninteresting. Instead, America's got all the negative attention with 9-11, two wars, the Patriot Act, and torture camps. Many people simply know more about the United States than about Russia. Or let's say they pretty much don't know anything about Russia, consider Putin as some sort of czar and maybe no foreign minister Lavrov, but that is about it. Even before Putin officially uh, described his Ukraine war as a denazification effort, countless propaganda channels had reported that there is a huge neo-Nazi conspiracy in Ukraine that wants to carry out genocide against the Slavic citizens. Put simply, Putin's secret service just crafted a narrative intended to remind Ukrainians of the German occupation under Erich Koch, during which around a quarter of the population was scheduled for annihilation. At the same time, the Russian population was uh, to be reminded of the Wehrmacht's eastern campaign and sieges such as that against Leningrad, Putin's hometown. The main enemy for the Russians are always white, non-Slavic people of Central and Northern European descent, regardless of whether they were the Teutonic Knights at the time of Alexander Nevsky, or the National Socialists in the Second World War, or today the Anglo-American elites. Some online influencers immediately try to assure their followers that Putin did not really mean Nazis in Ukraine, but the elders of Zion. He supposedly wants to liberate Ukraine from the Jewish world conspiracy. But no, he wants to push Anglo-Saxons out of Slavic territory and then Russify everything. And of course, there are no elders of Zion. The British colonial empire created its own banking system, the so-called fractional reserve banking system, and this was um, way more powerful than any other uh, empire's uh, banking system. And that new system required 
a large amount of intelligence operations to control all the moving parts. So you had to control uh, key politicians, you had to control the central bank, the Bank of England, and uh, you also had to uh, control these so-called private merchant banks, such as Barings or Rothschild. And especially these uh, merchant banks were, um, these merchant banks were nothing more than just front companies uh, for the elite's uh, intelligence services, specifically the crown and this gigantic family that's behind this. It's really, really a large complex of families that's been around for almost a thousand years now. And uh, they formed significant intelligence networks um, early on. And uh, those networks predate the modern bureaucratic type intelligence services. So it wasn't uh, really hard to um, create this sort of a banking system. And uh, it is a fairy tale um, that small, very small Jewish banking families supposedly took over the mighty colonial British Empire and then took over the United States and then created a revolution in Russia. And so, um, yeah, um, given Stalin's Holodomor and decades of Soviet occupation, it's not surprising that a few people in Ukraine today are neo-Nazis and believe the fairy tales that the elders of Zion took over the British Empire and, and the US. The often named Azov Battalion formed as a militia organization uh, in 2014 and fought against the pro-Russian forces. It is estimated that there are 2,500 members and only part of them belong to the radical core. Is Putin really afraid of a few neo-Nazis? Hardly likely. The Azov political party in a coalition with other far-right parties won roughly 2% of the vote in the 2019 general election. According to estimates, the number of members is around 10,000. From the Russian point of view, there is a quick, cheap and easy way to force Ukraine's surrender, the use of a few small nuclear weapons. But you need an excuse for that. Russian propaganda has clearly prepared for this option. Russian media quoted an unnamed source as saying Ukraine is on the verge of building a plutonium-based dirty bomb, although the source gave no evidence. The TASS, RIA and Interfax news agencies quoted a representative of a competent body in Russia as saying that Ukraine was developing nuclear weapons at the destroyed Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which was shut down in 2000. The Russia, uh, Russia's foreign ministry accused Ukraine of attempting to create nuclear weapons. Shortly before the invasion, Russian President Vladimir Putin said in a pathetic speech that Ukraine was using Soviet know-how to create its own nuclear weapons and that this was tantamount to preparing an attack on Russia. A nuclear exchange with the Russians makes no sense for Ukraine, especially not with very limited capacities on the part of Kiev and large quantities of warheads cannot be easily built unnoticed. So it's it's very easy to false flag this sort of thing. There's all, you can always find um, some old warheads from Soviet times or you can find, uh, you can source um, smaller quantities of plutonium or highly enriched uranium and once you have about 10 to 15 kilos of that substance you can create uh, an actual atomic bomb. The bomb design is fairly simple. The hard part is really just sourcing uh, highly enriched uranium or plutonium. The study named Russia's war with Ukraine is to acquire military industrial cap capability and human resources by Jokel Johannesson from Norway uh, from 2017 put forward the important thesis Russia seriously needs to steal 30 to 40 million people and the war-related industry. It became obvious as early as the 1990s that the KGB didn't trust its own population. That is why a special team of second and third tier KGB agents, such as Putin, was assembled to move money out of the country to keep it from falling into the hands of the Russian citizens. Actually investing in the population was deemed too dangerous which halted population growth and killed any and every spark in innovation in the industry. 
That is why Russian companies could not, for the life of them, make up for the loss of production and servicing in Ukraine. Putin may pretend to be a dictator, but when he gives an order, maybe 20% of it can be implemented and not even in a timely manner. The laws of physics apply, hence the invasion. Go read the study. I have linked it in the description. It is about all kinds of military goods and the Russians truly need this stuff. Now, um, there may be a declaration of martial law in Russia. And this declaration of martial law in Russia may have been pre-planned, especially because the sanctions would tank the economy. Food stamps and forced labor does not sound enticing, but with the appropriate packaging, it could be marketed as a sign of strength rather than an admission of economic weakness, a lack of popular political support for the Putin regime and a faltering military campaign in Ukraine. Socialist fanfare is not an option anymore because younger people hadn't been around during the old days or don't remember it. Uh, but instead, the government could proclaim a constitutional monarchy with Putin as the czar, sanctioned by neo-Roman Christian Orthodox claptrap. This would correspond with the tradition of the Russian Empire, which is more than a thousand years old, as well as the tradition of ancient Rome, which also influenced Europe in the Middle Ages. Martial law has never been introduced in modern Russia. Martial law would be instituted by presidential decree to be promulgated forthwith, forthwith uh, through radio and television. No precise limits of powers are defined. The details include special operation of critical infrastructure and hazardous facilities, evacuation of important objects and people, um, restrictions on entry, exit and freedom of movement, searches, restrictions on the choice of residents, uh, curfews, military censorship of communications, uh, restricting the sale of weapons, dangerous substances, drugs and alcohol, ban on rallies and strikes, um, prohibition of public international foreign organizations that undermine the security of the country, forced labor for defense purposes, uh, confiscation of private property, detention of unreliable citizens, restriction of economic activity, limiting the search and dissemination of information, uh, change in working hours, the abolition of the voluntary employment system and the introduction of labor service, compulsory for all citizens over 14 years of age. Uh, the main powers to ensure martial law rest in the hands of the Russian president. Now, the actual KGB leadership probably built the Putin personality called not only to obfuscate things domestically and to pretend leadership structures are as simple as one man barking orders, but to obfuscate internationally and to have the option to ditch Putin at a strategically opportune moment. The Ukraine war can be fought to the bitter end. The KGB poisons Putin into a heart attack or end stage cancer. He disappears and the KGB then presents new puppets to feign a reset, a chance. Uh, to restore the normal uh, way of things. It was all Putin's idea, they will claim, then uh, make some concessions and resume trade internationally. There are several ways this can proceed and how this can end. Uh, we can't look inside of these uh, elite structures to tell you exactly which option available to them they're going to use but we can pretty much tell you what their options are so people can then counter these options and not uh, get taken for a ride and not get deceived so um, please follow this channel and like this uh, video and uh, comment down below and share this of course with others